Julian's with us. Okay, let's see who else. We've just Julian. Julian, it's just you and me right now. Do you have any questions? Uh, no. Well, no, wait a minute. There's another uh, excellent student, Darren. Darren is with us also. How about you, Darren? Do you have any questions? I do not. <laughs> okay. That's fine. This is fine. This is strength of materials. And we're studying uh, bending. Bending stress, I believe, is what we're doing. And we're studying the uh, flexure formula. Seems like that's what we did last time, the flexure formula. Some people put a little B there for uh, bending stress. Now there's a minus there because when, uh, when Y is positive, <clears throat> you get compression. But see, when Y is negative, you got two negatives there. When y is negative, you get tension. Tension's positive, compression's negative. They call that the flexure formula. This here's your bending moment. And this right here is the uh, mass, uh, no, it's the area moment of inertia. Actually, there, there I, I kind of have a stupid question. <laughs> go ahead. Um, so, like, when does it, like, is it right in the middle where it switches from being, like, compression to tension when you're That's bending? right. Yeah. Okay. They, they call it the neutral axis. Okay. But it's still bent, right? Oh, absolutely. Like it would, it's still so, bent. But when you bend... Uh, Whatever it is, I don't care what the shape is. It could be a, a two by four, you know. Uh, that looks more like a two by five. But anyway, <laughs> uh, when you're right here in the middle, at the centroid, there's no there's no strain and there's no stress. It uh, mm. there's there's no normal there's no normal stress. Now in chapter seven, I think we're in chapter six. In chapter seven, you'll discover there is shear stress in the middle of a beam. See, we're talking about a beam here. But but there's no normal stress because see y is zero. Mm. Y is uh, there you go. There, there's, there's y. Y is the distance from the center, and if it's zero, you don't have any normal stress. But we'll learn. Okay. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That we'll, we'll... that that makes me feel a lot better. That like there is something going on there, but we just haven't learned about it yet. Right. It's shear stress is what it is, but it's not normal stress. Now you know the difference. Uh, shear stress is when you have like stuff is sliding on one another. Uh, wood is real bad about that because it has it has a grain to it, and it can uh, it can fail with shear stress for sure. But that's chapter seven. And <clears throat> so you and that that eye thing there that's called the uh, 
It's called the moment of inertia. We'll be doing some of those today. And the name of that is the area moment of inertia. And it's it's in weird units. It's the meters to the fourth power. Now, if you're in English, it might be inches to the fourth fourth power, or it could be feet to the fourth power. It's some it's something to the fourth power, uh, some unit of distance for sure. And the uh, equation for it. Uh, I think we showed you this. Uh, I think we showed you that. Pretty sure we did. Let, let, me, let me look in my uh, textbook here and see if I can find that and refresh my memory. The flexor formula. Well, I see it there on page uh, 294. And they're talking about it on page 295. Uh, wait a minute, they, they're using this, uh, uh, I had that wrong, it, it should be a y, it's a y squared dA, now I got it right, and it's on page 295. Well, let me see who else we got on board here, class, class starts in two minutes, let's see who we, oh, we got a good crowd, we got, we got Shane, Alex, Ashley, Ben, yeah, Darren and Julian. We've got a good crowd. Braxton. Yeah, we got a good crowd of uh, students there. How about any of you? Do you have any uh, comments or questions before we jump into this? Uh... Well, we we want to know how to work this flexure formula. Is what we want. Any comments or questions? Okay, well let's uh, let's concentrate on this thing here, this area moment of inertia, shall we? That'll be good. Uh, because unless you get that, you can't you can't use the flexure formula. I showed you where this came from the other day, but we we got to talk about that uh, area moment of inertia. Okay. Well, see, if, if you just have a rectangle, it's real simple. It's, uh, you look in the flap of your boat, for the front flap. In the very front flap of your boat, they have uh, area moments of inertia. And for a rectangle like that, it's 1 12th the base times the height cubed. See, here's the base, here's the height. And I mean, we could derive that if you wanted. Well, that'd be kind of fun. Uh, here, let's, let's derive it. That'll just take a minute. And you can see where it came from. You, you have to do a calculus trick here. You have to uh, make this into little slices like that. And, and that's your little area DA. Here, we'll, we'll color it. There we go. And, and you see that little area DA is equal to uh, the base, which is the width of it, times the height, which is DY. See, Y is this distance here, and DY would be the thickness yeah, that almost makes sense. 
see, see d, dy is the thickness and what you do what you do is you just integrate this okay well here let me do that uh, let's see we got the integral of y squared da well now da is b d1 it's the base times the height yep b d1 now we're going to go from uh, uh, we want to do the whole thing so it'd be minus h over 2 to plus h over 2 that makes sense okay we're doing some algebra and some calculus now now when you integrate this what you get is b y cubed over 3 uh, i think we're done all we got to do is plug in the uh, the minus h over 2 and the plus h over 2. Here we go. Now when you plug in the plus h over 2, you get b over 3 h cubed over 8. But see, you have to subtract what you get when you plug in the minus h over 2. And when you plug that in, you get b over 3 well, uh, you'll get a minus h cubed. Uh, you'll get a minus h cubed over 8. Okay, now let's see what we got here. That's a 24th and that's a 24th. Only a minus and a minus make a plus. The 24th plus a 24th is a 12th. So you wind up with a 1 12th b h cubed well that's the formula that they give you for a rectangle in the flap of your book if you got a book and they open to the flap there they got rectangles there right there it says 1 12th b h cubed we just derived we just derived that uh, formula there for a rectangle. Now be careful, that's only true for a rectangle. Here, I'll draw you a little rectangle, there you go. Now, I wish we had more time together, because if we did, I, we could derive the triangle and the trapezoid and the semicircle and the circle. Wouldn't that be fun? We could, we could derive all those things and have a, a lot of fun, but we don't have time. Uh, but that's how you do it. Okay, well, let's do, a, let's do a, uh, an example of uh, finding the area moment of inertia of something a little harder, maybe. Unless there's a comment or question. Can you guys read all that? Do I need to write darker? Let me see if I got a darker pen here. That was not very good. Let's try this one. Look, that's better. There, ta -da, I'll, I'll use that one. Any comments or questions before we move on? All right. Well, if you're happy, I'm happy. Our topic today is uh, it's in chapter six, and we want to talk about the flexure formula. And part of the flexure formula is this business right here, this uh, mo area moment of inertia thing. It'd be nice to understand that. Okay, well, let's do one. Here we go. I'm going to erase all this if you're happy. All right, say goodbye to that wonderful derivation there. Let's do this one here. Now, this one's a uh, P63. Man, I forget what we've done and what we haven't done. If I've already done this, somebody speak up. I don't want to do it over again. But it's a beam. Uh, it's sort of an upside down T beam is what it is. Sort of an upside down T beam. Uh, 
Now this distance is 0.2 meters. This is on page uh, 301. Uh, this distance is 0.1 meter. This is 0.1 meter. This is 0.3 meters. Uh, that little itty bitty distance right there, that would have to be 0.05 meters. <clears throat> and the first thing we got to do is find the centroid. Because remember, in this equation, in this equation here, that y is the distance from the centroid. Or, or as one of my excellent students said a minute ago, it's the distance from the middle. Uh, the correct term is centroid, but oh well. Somewhere in here is a centroid. Uh, it's kind of weighted down here a ways because, because it's, it's got this uh, heavy thing down there. Maybe not that far down. I don't know exactly uh, where it is. We've got to find out. Well, we have an equation for that. The centroid, see, we're, we're talking about the distance y now measured from the bottom Th this is your symbol for your centroid they put a little bar over it there it's just equal to uh, if, if you wrote it as summations it'd be like that if you wrote it as integrations you'd write it like this Centroidal formulas always look like that. Now here's how you find the centroid. We, we got to find that centroid <clears throat> before we can work the problem. <coughs> what you want to do is you want to put a little spot right here in the center of this rectangle here. Now that distance is, let me think about it. I think it's 2.5 meters. If I'm wrong, somebody speak up. And then you need a, a, a little spot right here in the middle of this one. And that I have no doubt, that distance is 0.05 because it's half a point 0.1. And now we can do our, now we can do our centroid. Here we go. The centroid for this thing here is going to be 0 0.05 times the area of this little thing here, that little rectangle, which will be 0 0.2 times 0.1. Plus, see this, you gotta sum these babies up. Plus the 2.5. No, no, it's 0.25. Somebody could have gotten a thank you point. I want you guys to help me and stay awake here. That's a 0.25 to the middle there. It's not 2.5. Help me, help. Okay. Is it 0.25 or is it 0.2? This is uh, Alex okay. speaking, by the way. Okay. I just seen that the total was a uh, 0.3 plus 0.1, and then is it just half of that? No, it's a. Uh, pretend you got two different rectangles. Halfway to the. Uh, this one would be po uh, 0.15. Yeah. Of course, of course, this would be 0.15. Now, is this Derek? Am I talking to Derek? Oh, no. This is Alex. I see where you Alex. got it now. You're okay, Alex, with the point two. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I see it's the point one five plus the point yeah. one. Right. Good going, Alex. Okay, now uh, let me get this right now. I've got the... 
and point yeah the point two five times the area of that one which is point three times point one. But see, you have to divide by the total area, which is point two times point one plus the point three times point one. Okay, I'll give you forty-five seconds. You guys have calculators. Find the uh, uh, centroid. Go ahead. There it is. Find it. Okay, let me let me go to one of my very best students here, and we'll ask Ben Seaman. Ben Seaman, unmute and say hello, please, Ben. Good morning. Hey, good morning. It's raining here at my house. How about you? Yeah, pretty ugly out there. Yeah, it's raining. It's cold. Yeah. I just fed my dog, our dog. Okay, uh, uh, Ben Seaman, what'd you get for this uh, centroid? Did you do it yet? I got 0.17 meters. That's what I got. I got a uh, distance to the centroid of 0.17 meters. Now, let me think. Now, there's 0.1 meters. Uh, 0.2 meters would be about to here. Uh, maybe up just a tad more, but it's pretty dang close where I put it. See, see that distance there? Going up to here is 0.17 meters. Hope you can read my sloppy writing there. Okay, hey, we got the centroid now. Now, now that's where the neutral axis is going to be. I'll just be lazy and say in a neutral axis. See, everything above that will be compression. Everything below that will be tension. The, the maximum, let me tell you where the maximum stress is going to be. The, whatever the bending moment and whatever the moment of inertia is, they're the same everywhere on this piece. What's different is the value of y. That's the distance from the centroid. Can you see that the distance here from the centroid up to here is bigger than the distance from here down to here? So therefore, this is where you'll have your maximum normal stress. Now, now let me let me ask one of my excellent students, Ben Harris. Ben Harris, uh, unmute and say hello, please, Ben Harris. Hi. Hey, Ben, you're going to have your maximum normal stress right up in here, because that's where you have the maximum distance y. But Ben Harris, is that going to be tension or compression? You have a 50-50 chance on this, Ben. Tension or compression, 50-50 chance. I think I missed because I'm not understanding where the, the stresses are and everything. Well, see, this is your flexor formula. And we can find what the stress is any place on this cross section. All you need to know is what the bending moment is. You get that from your uh, bending moment loading diagram. And today we're practicing getting this moment of inertia. But right now I'm asking you, that Y is bigger going from here to here than it is any other place on this beam cross section. See the beam, the beam goes back like this. And it's being bent because somebody is putting a heavy weight on it and it sags. And what I'm asking you is, 
is this maximum stress tension or compression? And you have compression. A, boy, boy, Joe, he got it right. <laughs> he got it right. Good going. Yeah, it's compression up here on the top, and it'll be tension on the bottom. It turns out that the compressive normal stress is bigger than the tensile normal stress because the y is bigger going from here up to here than it is going from here down to here yeah and we know exactly where the neutral axis is it's at 0 0.17 from the bottom we did that now uh I just had a senior moment. I don't know what we're going to do now. Let me let me uh, stall here and have a drink of water, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do now. Yeah, I know what we're going to do now. We're going to find we're going to find this thing here. We're going to find the <clears throat> area moment of inertia. Now to do that, we're going to Mr. Go Griffin, go ahead. Uh, I'm a little bit confused about that point two five. Can you explain me one time more, please? I'd be glad to, Mohammed. Thanks for asking. Thank Mohammed, this distance from here to here is 0 0.1 meters. You okay with that? Yes. Uh, the distance. To, to uh, halfway, we're going to go halfway on this thing here. And <clears throat> I don't know if I put that exactly halfway. I tried to. Might be more like that. But Mohammed, this distance from here to here is half of the point three. See, the whole, this whole distance is point three. This here is point one five. That's half of point three. Now we're going to add those two, 0 0.15, 0 0.1, I get 0.25. So from here up to, to here is 0.25. Oh, okay. You okay? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. See where that, see where that 0.25 is? Yes, I got it. Thank you so That's much. That's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for asking. Okay, now we're gonna, in order to uh, to solve this, let me let me make a little erasures here so I can have some room to work here. Got all kinds of stuff on here, making it confusing for everybody. Okay, now, now we know where this is. That, that's the uh, centroid, <coughs> and it is at 0.17. Mohammed, did, did you understand that 0.17? Yes, sir. Good going. That's 0.17. But see, what we need right now is the distance to the the centroid of this rectangle and the distance to this centroid of this rectangle. Now this distance here is, <clears throat> I'll just write it for you, it'll be uh, 0.17 minus the 0 0.05 because I know this is 0 0.05 and if that, if this distance here is 0.17 to the centroid then that distance is 0 0.12. That distance is 0 0.12. And we're also going to need this distance here. The distance from the centroid to the center of, of this rectangle here. Now that's going to be the 0 0.25. Does, does this show up on? Yeah, it shows up. It's going to be 0 0.25 minus the 0 0.17. Okay, uh, I think that's 0.08. Did I do that right? Uh, yeah, it's smaller. 
it's 0 0.08. We need those in order to find the moment of inertia of this whole figure. Okay, we have to use the parallel axis theorem. Let me write it for you. Parallel axis theorem. The, the moment of inertia about uh, uh, <clears throat> Okay, I just had another senior moment. I'm doing all right. Just a minute now. Let me collect my thoughts here. Uh, well, I know how the parallel axis theorem goes. It goes like this. That's how it goes. In fact, it's, it's in your book. I think I showed it to you last time. What you do is, uh, we're going to do this for both rectangles. We have, we have this tall vertical rectangle, and then we have this uh, shorter, wider rectangle. And we're just going to add them up and get the uh, total <clears throat> moment of inertia for this whole figure here. And here I go. It's going to be 1 12th. We'll do this bottom one first, 0.2 times 0.1 cube. It's 1 12th BH cube. Did, didn't I just derive that for you here a minute ago? Yeah, remember I derived that. There's, there's all these formulas here. It's, one of them is 1 12th BH cube. And I derived it for you. Well, that's 1 12th the base, which is 0.2 times the height, which is 0.1 cube. Ah, but see, the centroid of the whole piece is up here at 0.17. So you have to take the area, which is 0.2 times 0.1, and multiply the distance between, between the, the center of area, the centroid for this rectangle here in the, the centroid for the whole piece. And that distance is uh, 0.12. You have to square it. Now I'm not done yet. All I've done is this bottom piece. We're going to have to add to that the moment of inertia of that, that taller rectangle. So here goes. <clears throat> See, that's going to be 1 12th. 0.1 times 0.3 cubed plus the area of that one, which is 0.1 times 0.3 times the distance between the center of it and the centroid of the whole piece, which is 0.08. This should be it, guys. If you take all of this here and all of this and add them up, we should get uh, the centroid of the whole piece. Go ahead and do that. I'll give you a minute, and we'll see if we can get the right answer. Plug all that in. Well, I, I got an answer, but I'll give you a little more time. <clears throat> I 
Let me see if anybody's got that. Let me go to my friend here. Uh, let me go to my friend. Shane, Shane, unmute and say hello, please, Shane. Uh, Earth calling Shane, Earth calling Shane, come in, Shane. Uh-oh, coffee break. Uh, Samuel, Samuel, unmute and say hello, please. Morning. Hey, good morning. Samuel, did you plug in these numbers here? Uh, not these, uh, these here. Did you plug these in and get the moment of inertia for this uh, upside down T? Um, yeah, I got 0 0.000722 meters to the fourth. I think Samuel, I think Samuel's got it right. Now, now what I got is the same thing he got, 7.21, a bunch of sixes, times 10 to the minus fourth meters to the fourth. And what he said was point. 0, 0.000, right, Samuel? Three zeros? Yes, that's right. It's the same thing. And, and you just rounded off. You went 722, two, which is okay with me. So you did great. Now let's see how we did. We have answers in the back. This is preliminary problem 6-3. Uh, go, go to the back of your book and, and find where they have these answers. Preliminary problem six, three, I don't see it. Now, there it is. Uh, here's what they said. They said, first of all, they said uh, 0.17 meters. Hey, that's what we got. Yay, that's what we got. And then they said uh, 0.722 times 10 to the minus third meters to the fourth. This is what the book says. I think that's the same thing we got. See, if you make this minus third, it makes it bigger. You'd have to go 0.7 to round off the two, yeah. Yay, we got that right. You did good job. Any questions on that? Well, let's do some more. Let's do some more because, see, we can't use the flexure formula. Here's the flexure formula. Unless we can get this moment of inertia right, we'll never be able to use it. We won't be able to find the stress. Okay, here's another one. Let's try this one. This is problem 681. I'm going to erase all this unless you guys have a question. I'm going to erase it. All right. Well, goodbye for that one. That was preliminary problem 6-3. It was on page 301. And we did a good job. We're going to do another one now. Now, now, this is problem uh, 681. Uh, let me find it. 681. Uh, 681, still haven't found it yet. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> now, what we should do is to do this to scale. But I'm too lazy to do it to scale. What, what, we got another deal. It's sort of an upside down T, isn't it? Where this is, uh, this is 300 millimeters. <clears throat> and this is mm, 30 millimeters. 
And then they have another <clears throat> another one down here. Where this is 30 millimeters. <coughs> and this is 300 millimeters. Now, now, did I do those to scale? Just a minute here. Let's see. Uh, I can't bend my fingers up. Uh, uh, hang on a second here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, that's pretty dang close. <coughs> okay. <coughs> We're doing 681. I'm on page 307. Uh, the beam of, uh, is made of a material having allows, allowable tensile and compressive stress of blah, blah, blah. Find the maximum moment that can be applied to the beam. Okay. I bet we can do that. It's kind of like that last problem. Do you remember on that last problem, because the uh, centroid was located kind of down lower here, the distance y was bigger up to here. So you're going to have your maximum just like that last problem we did. The, the maximum normal stress, and, and it will be compressive, it will be compressive normal stress. The maximum compressive uh, normal stress will be right there at the top, right? And they, they give it to us. They said uh, it's going to be 125 megapascals. Now you're going to have your maximum tensile stress down here at the bottom, but see, it'll be smaller, just like it was in that last problem. If you don't understand that, just speak up and ask, and I'll go over it again. But what we're going to do is we're going to use the uh, fortune formula. No, that's not it. Fortune formula. No, no, it's the uh, flexure formula. Not the fortune formula. That sounds like going to the uh, casino again. We're going to use the flexure formula. <coughs> and you know how it goes. <clears throat> they want us to find this M here. <clears throat> but to find it, we need the y and the i. Well, that y, and that's the distance from the centroid. We don't even have that yet. And this i is the area moment of inertia. We don't have that yet. So we have to get those. Okay, well, we can do it. Now let's get, let's find the, uh, the centroid. Now to find the centroid, <coughs> The dirty little secret is you make a, a, in the middle right here, you make a dot. And in the middle right here, you make a dot. I think I may need Griffin? to. Yes, I'm listening. Um, so we have the compression on the top and tension on the bottom, right? That's, that's right. Okay, so on the book, it says that the allowable stress for tensile is 125 megapascal. Shouldn't be that at the, that that 125 should be at the bottom. Honk and thank you point for Muhammad. He's absolutely right. Uh, I need to get glasses, Muhammad, because the compression that little bitty C there is 150, isn't it? Yes. Thank you. That's Muhammad's thank you point. He did a good job. Now <clears throat> here we go. We're going to get the. Uh, we're going to get the centroid. And remember how you do that. You take uh, this distance from here to here. You know what that is? That's uh, 15. Only I like 0 0.015. We want to do it in meters. 
Well, we're going to measure everything from the bottom here. So you got 0.015 that goes to the middle there. Yeah, that's good. Times 0.3 times 0.03. Plus, now I need this distance up to here. Now, let me think about this. Now, let's see, that's 150 plus uh, 30. It's 180, isn't it? It's 0.018 times 0.03 times 0.3. Now, we're going to divide by the sum of the areas, which is 0.3 times 0.03 plus 0.03 times 0.3. Go ahead and find the centroid for me. I'll shut up for a minute. You do it. Professor? Yeah. Shouldn't the distance from the bottom to the second centroid be 0.18 instead of 0 0.018? Uh, you know what? <laughs> who, who is that? This is Ben Seaman. Uh, ben Seaman. Honkin. Honk and thank you point for Ben Seaman. He's absolutely right. And I, I was absolutely wrong. But that distance there should be uh, the 150 plus the 30, which makes 180. Guys, change that. Th thanks to Ben, we're going to get this right. Otherwise, I was going to get it wrong. See, uh, between us, we have one good brain. Okay, start over again. I'm going to do it over again. I had it all wrong. And let's try it again. Thank you, Ben. Good going. I love it when the students stay awake during this. Well, I got an answer. Hey, Ben, uh, that was Ben Seaman that helped me, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah, and Ben, do, do you have this figured out yet? I got 0 0.0975 meters. That's what I got, too. I bet that's right. Now, let me see where that'll be. <clears throat> See, uh, that distance there is 150. 97 is about like that. I don't know. It's kind of kind of in here someplace, guys. That That's your neutral axis, right? There's your neutral axis. And that, that distance from here to here is point. 0.0975 meters. We're doing great. We've got the um, centroid. By the way, uh, what that is, <coughs> is if you took this thing, and, and say you built one of these, you get some boards and glue them together or whatever, it kind of Kind of makes a tomahawk or a uh, hammer type affair, and you and you toss it. Give it a toss and give it a spin. You know what? It's going to spin about that center of gravity right there, or the center of mass. That's what it spins about. That's kind of interesting. But we're making a beam here. We got a beam that's going back here, like so.
and we know it has uh, compression on the top, tension on the bottom. I forget what I was going to say. And, and nothing here, right here, right here at the centroid, it's the neutral axis. It's not tension, it's not compression. And the maximum strain and the maximum stress is going to occur right up here. It'll be compressive and it'll be in the 150. Now we're going to need these distances right here in order to use our parallel axis theorem. This distance here is, now let me think, uh, hmm. well, it'd be 180 minus the, I'm thinking that that distance is the point 180 minus the point 0975. Does that make sense? I, I think it does. Because see, that, that's what that distance is. From here to here is 0 0.0975. And from here up to here is the 0 0.180. Okay. That's eh, too hard for me to do in my head. But my calculator can cut it. The, uh, subtract uh, 0 0.0975. I'm getting 0 0.08. Two five. That's what that distance is right there. Point oh eight two five. Now I need this distance here in order to use the parallel axis theorem. Remember the parallel axis theorem goes like this. There it is. That's the parallel axis theorem. You, you, you have to get the distance between the, the centroid of this rectangle and the, the uh, center of gravity of the whole piece. Well, we did that distance. This distance here is going to be the 0.08 to... No, no. I don't know if we've done that distance yet. I, I need this distance here. Yeah, there we go. Now that distance is going to be, uh, let me think, uh, that'll be at the 0 0.0975 minus the 0 0.03. Let me write that down. 0 0.0975 subtract the 0 0.030. I could almost do that in my head. 0.0675, that looks pretty good. This distance is 0 0.0675. See, that's what we're talking about here. The distance between the center of gravity of the whole thing and the center of gravity of whatever piece you're talking about. Okay, now we're gonna get the moment. Uh, this is wrong. That's wrong. What I'm talking about is the moment of inertia. There we go. That was wrong what I wrote. Somebody could have jumped on me and, and told me to fix that, but I, I caught that one. Okay, let's do it. I need some room here. Uh, we'll sacrifice this. We'll sacrifice this. Here we go. Uh, the moment of inertia of the whole thing is going to be one twelfth point three times point zero oh three cubed plus point three times point zero oh three times the point zero oh six seven five point zero oh six seven five square Plus, we got to add this one now. This one will be 1 12th 0 0.03 times 0 0.3 cubed plus 0 0.03 
0.3 times the 0 0.0825 squared. Okay, I want you to put that in your calculators. That's going to be the moment of inertia of this upside down T beam. On your mark, get set, go. Uh, let's see if we can agree on this. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Uh, the second distance you find, don't you think it should be the point zero nine seven five minus the point zero one five instead of a point zero three zero? Uh, you know what, Mohammed, Mohammed, good going, Mohammed. You're absolutely right. What I want is what I did was wrong, Mohammed. It's so easy to teach this class. This class could teach itself. If that distance was wrong, uh, that would be 0.96. Th this was wrong, wasn't it, Mohammed? Yes. Uh, what I need is the 0 0.0975 minus the uh, 0 0.015. 0 0.015. Good going, Mohammed gets. Now, are one of those yours, Mohammed, already? Yes, sir. You got two of them today. Well, maybe maybe go for three. Okay, now let's see. That's uh, how about 0 0.0825, Mohammed? Does that look good? Yeah. 0.96. Now wait a minute. Five is two. Uh. Five. Oh yeah, that's fine. You're good. One oh eight two five? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Well I have point oh eight two yeah. five. Did I goof up up here? Is that point oh eight two five also? Yeah. They're both the yes. same, aren't they? Yes. Point oh eight two five. You know what? They're both the same because these areas are the same. You know that? They happen to be the same. All right, now, thanks to Mohammed, I think I got the right value here. Put, put that in your calculators, please. Let's see what we get. Okay, I, I got an answer. <clears throat> I got an answer for the uh, moment of inertia of this upside down T shape of 1.906 blah, 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 times 10 to the minus 4 meters to the fourth. Now, if you got that, say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. one. I need another one. Uh -huh. I bet that's right. I bet that's right. Now look here, guys. We we just figured out. No, we didn't figure that out. We figured this one out. We got that. And, and we know where the maximum compressive stress is going to be. It's going to be from from the neutral axis up to here. And how how big is that? Uh, well, I don't know. It's uh, let me think about this. It would be uh, be three hundred thirty minus uh, three hundred thirty. See, from here, from the bottom up to the very top, I think it's three hundred thirty. But see, you'd want to subtract 
the 0975. And so I think what I want here is I wonder if I subtracted right. 0.2325. You think this distance from the centroid up to the top is 0.2325. Might be. It might be. Was that an uh-huh? Uh-huh. I bet I bet it's good. Okay, hey, look at here. Uh we we got this now. We got everything. We know that. We know this. We know that we can solve for the bending moment that will cause problems on this thing. Uh, here, I can write it out for you. Let me find some room here. Uh, we'll sacrifice this stuff, I guess. All right, we've got 150 megapascal. Uh, never mind the minus sign. I'm just going to put in the numbers. I, I, I know it's compression. That's what the minus is for. I don't need that minus. And, and this here, we're going to solve for it. And we think this is 0.2325 meters, if we did that right. And we think this is 1.90 oh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, do that. Do that for me, and find the bending moment that will cause uh, the problem. Here it goes. Well, I got an answer. <clears throat> I got an answer of 123.0 kilonewton meters. If this thing has that kind of a uh, bending moment acting on it, you're going to exceed the uh, maximum compressive stress. Now let's look at the answer. This was 681, and they said 123 kilonewton meters. This is what the book got. How about you? Did you get that? If you did, say uh huh. Uh huh. There's yep. one. Yeah. Good going. Well, that was fun. Uh, it's time to do another one. Before we go on, though, is, was there any any question or comment on that? Did we ignore the negative sign in this equation? Yeah, the negative sign. See, y is positive because you're going up. See, y is positive going up. And so if that's a positive, this is a positive, that's a positive. So the whole thing comes out uh, negative. Negative means compression. Now, if y is negative, you've got a negative here, a positive, and a negative. Two negatives make a positive. That's positive. So positive means tension. If, if you go down here, y is negative. If you go up, y is positive. All that minus does is it helps you decide whether you have tension or compression. 
Did, did that make sense? Yes, thank you. Anytime. Anybody else? Okay, well, I'm going to erase this. We'll do another one. All right. And now there's some homework. I was looking at the schedule there, and th there is some homework. And it is uh, homework number 21, I believe. Yeah, homework 21, and it's uh, F611. So that's pretty easy for you to do, rack up some good homework points. If you don't know how to do it, they do those in the back, those fundamental problems. Isn't that nice of them? But that's due uh, today's Wednesday, right? No, today's Tuesday. That's due Friday. It's due Friday. Okay, let's let's do another problem now. Now this is problem six sixty. We're going to do problem six sixty three. Let me find it. Six sixty three. Shop around. Ah, uh -huh. here we go. You have a, a circular rod or a steel, it's a steel shaft. Okay, you got a steel shaft. And you have uh, some pulleys, it looks like. You got some pulleys. Put one here, another one here. Let me see if I can space these out better. Put one here, one here, one here. There we go. That's pretty good. And then there's some uh, external forces. Well, the pulleys have a belt and they have tension in them. And, and the belt is pulling this one down 500 pounds. And this one is 300 pounds. And this one is 500 pounds. <clears throat> now we're going to have to find the, uh, the forces at A and B. This is just a smooth collar is what it amounts to at A. <clears throat> And B is, is just a smooth collar there. J journal, smooth journal bearings at A and B. Okay, so uh, first we got to get this force here and this force here. Now, because of the symmetry, it looks to me like you're going to have half of 1300 pounds. Mm, I can't do that in my head. What, what's half of 1300? Six fifty. I think you got 650 pounds here, 650 pounds here. I'll be glad to go through that in more detail. Does anybody need my help on that 650 pounds? If nobody needs my help, then we'll just continue. These distances are 20 inches. Okay. The diameter of the shaft is, it's a two inch, two inch diameter. All right.
they want to know the maximum bending stress in the shaft. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a shear loading diagram. Then we're going to make a bending moment loading diagram. Now I'm going to shut up for just a tiny minute. And I want you to make the shear loading diagram. I'll be quiet. And then we'll do it together. Go for it. Draw the shear loading diagram. Do you remember how to do it? You take sections, left hand sections. you got to think about it for a minute. If you section this steel shaft any place in here, just just section, just make a section in there. Can you see that you got to have a shear force going down? It's an internal shear force going down of 650 pounds going down because you got 650 external force going up. Some of the forces have to be zero. So you got a negative 650 pounds of shear. Shear going down on a left hand member is positive. So you got a positive shear of 650 pounds in there. And then what happens is this takes a drop. It goes down 500 pounds, which puts you at 150, 150 pounds. See, if you section this anywhere in here, can you see that you've got to have a shear going down of 150? Look, you've got 650 going up. 500 going down, don't you have to have 150 going down for equilibrium? Well, 150 shear going down on the left hand member is considered positive. See, positive is here, negative will be down here. Then right here, you drop 300. I didn't draw my arrow there, let me draw that. You drop 300. Well, you know what that does for you? That brings you down here to a negative 150. And you got negative 150 pounds of shear everywhere in here. If you sectioned it in here, you have to have, in this case, it's shear going up 150. And finally, it drops down 500, which puts you at 650, a negative 650 pound. Did your shear loading diagram look like that? I hope so. Now we're going to do the bending moment loading diagram. We got some lovely equations. One of them goes like this. And that says the shear is equal to the slope of the bending moment loading diagram. Well, the uh, shear is positive, so the slope must be positive. It must be coming up here 
By the way, it starts at zero and ends at zero because these smooth collars don't give you any, they don't give you any moment. They don't give you any twist. They're just a smooth collar. Put a drop of oil on there. Well, all they allow the rod to do is to rotate. Okay. And so if the slope is positive, then it goes up like this to there. Another way of looking at it is uh, the change in your bending moment is the integration of your shear force. But you guys learned that that's just the area. You can get the area. What's the area of something that's 650 pounds times 20 inches? Man, I don't know. What's 650 times 20? I'm getting 13,000. You know what? This is 13,000 inch pounds. That's your moment. And look here, the slope here is smaller. So it does this. It goes smaller slope to here. And how much, what is your change in your bending moment going from here to here, from 13,000 to something? Well, it's the area. It's the area of your shear dagger. Well, what's this area? Well, it's 150 times 20 inches. Let me do that. 150 pounds times 20 inches. I get 3,000 inch pounds. So you know what? If that's 3,000 inch pounds, then this must be 16,000 inch pounds. Because you had 13,000 and you went up 3,000. And then guess what? You're going to go down 3,000. So it goes down here to here. This will be 13,000 inch pounds. And then it drops down to zero. It'll drop down uh, the whole 13,000. And, and we're done. Da -da, we are done. Do I need to uh, explain that better? Well, nobody said anything. Okay, well, if you're happy, we're going to find the maximum bending stress. Well, here goes. Well, you know the formula. It goes like this. And see, we went through all that trouble in order to get this, this uh, 16,000 inch pounds. Uh, never mind the minus. It's going to be uh, compressive. And so it's 16,000 inch pounds times y. Well, now y, here I'll draw it bigger for you. Here, here's here's why it's one inch. So you go one inch, and then we have to divide by the moment of inertia for a round solid shaft. Well, it's right here in the in your book. It's one fourth. I'm looking at the flap of my book, and mine says one fourth pi r to the fourth. Now that's an inch. It's an inch to the fourth. See on this one here, it says one fourth pi r to the fourth. Okay. I want you to put this in your calculators and tell me what the uh, maximum stress is on this shaft with the three pulleys. Go for it.
Well, I got an answer for the maximum bending stress on this steel shaft. I tell you where it's going to happen. It's going to happen right in here. You can see that. That's the location for the maximum bending stress. And I think I know what it is, but let me call on one of my excellent students here. Uh, Shane, Shane, unmute and uh, say hello, please. Earth calling Shane. Earth calling Shane, come in, Shane. Uh, uh oh, uh, coffee break. Jackson, Jackson, unmute and, and say hello, please, Jackson. Hey, Jackson, did you did you plug this in and get the maximum bending stress? What'd you get? Got twenty thousand three hundred seventy-one point eight. That's what I got. I got twenty thousand. 371.8. Now, now, what's what's the units though, Jackson? What are the uh, units? Uh, PSI. I think it is. I agree with you. They're, they're PSI. Well, let's look and see how we did. This was problem uh, 663. Go to the back of the book, please. And we're going to see if we got what they got. 663. Hmm. They said 20.4 KSI. Well, that's the same thing, you know. It. The, the book says 20.4 KSI. Well, that's the same thing. They just, they just rounded theirs off a little bit, and I'm pretty happy about it. Do you have any questions about that? Okay, well let's uh, let's move on. We have uh, we have six minutes left in class. And we are going to uh, omit some of the uh, sections here. Omit, I want you here, let me make some room here. We have a few minutes left, and I want to talk to you about what happens when you go plastic. Can I ask you a question about the moment diagram? Uh, yes, go ahead. This problem, I just want to ask you generally. So, on the problem 641, uh, um, we got the moment as 2800. Do you know why, when we plot it on the moment diagram, why have you started from a negative? Uh, yeah, let me show you that. Uh, now you're talking about problem 641, is that what you said? Yes, yes. Let, let me find it. I, I got lost. Do you know what page that is, uh, Mohammed? Um, 88. It's on page 88? No, 288. 288, okay. One tiny minute here while I find it. And uh, now, now, what do you want to know about it, Mohammed? So, when we draw the moment, bending moment diagram for this problem, yeah, uh, the very first point is 2800. So, why we put the 2800 as negative in the bending moment diagram? Okay, uh, let me see if I can show you, Mohammed. Pretty good question. Uh, oh, I was going to tell you we were going to omit some pages there, uh, but I'll tell you that next time. Mohammed wants to wants me to talk about six forty one, and we we have a few minutes left, and I think I can answer his question. We have. We, we have a uh, distributed load acting on a beam. And we have an a, a external force acting on a beam. 
and this is a fixed connection. Now, fixed connections can give you moments. Mm -hmm. They can provide a couple. Can you see, because of all these forces tending to rotate you clockwise, that, that you're going to have you're going to have an external couple, an external bending, uh, external moment that's counterclockwise acting from the fixed connection. Uh, Mohammed say, uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now look, if, if you took a section right here and just forgot about everything else, forget about everything else right now, can you see that you're going to have to have an internal bending moment that's clockwise because this external bending moment, I don't know, why don't we call it EXT for external? This is internal, this is a bending moment. It's going to be clockwise. Got to be. Uh, equal and opposite, Newton's third law. Well, Moments that are clockwise are negative. Moments that are counterclockwise are positive. Mohammed wants to know how come the bending moment diagram starts off negative? Well, that's why. Does, does that make sense, Mohammed? Yes, I got it now. Hey, he's got it. Boy, boy, Joe, he's got it. Uh, Thank you so much. Oh, anytime, anytime. Uh, let, let me just tell you this. We're going to temporarily omit some pages here in this chapter. Pages 310 to page uh, 343. Temporarily, we're going to omit those pages. And on uh, Thursday, I, I want to talk about plastic bending. Thursday, the topic, they, they call it inelastic. That's what we'll talk about Thursday. It's on page 344. So you might want to, for now, omit those pages. Go to 344, read that. It's sad, but our, our time together is up for right now. Here's your last chance to say anything. Speak up, because I'm going to push this red button. Last chance, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Goodbye, students, for now. Bye, have a good, good day. day. Mr. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Take care.